This is what 1 Samuel 31 says. This is God's word for us. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchi Shua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died, and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and lived in them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilba. So they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. But when the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the body of his sons from the wall of Bethshan. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. Father, we pray you would, through your word today, Convict, give life, and heal. We believe that in your word accurately preached, you speak afresh. Through this dark and difficult chapter, would you speak afresh of your holiness, our sin, the reality of death, and show us some hope beyond the grave. For Jesus' sake, we pray and believe it to be so. Amen. You can be seated. Well, what a hard chapter, huh? The commentaries all say this is a tragedy. Aristotle defined a classic tragedy, something like this. Not the sad ending of a bad man, but the sad ending of a good man who had a small character flaw, which leads to his unforeseen and ironic demise, and thus evokes pity and bewilderment, and catharsis in the reader or the audience. Well, is the demise of Saul in this chapter a classic tragedy? Well, yes and no. There are moments in 1 Samuel when Saul was pretty good, or at least a, a mixed bag. His early flaws could be viewed as small, or at least relatable in, in common, the life and death of Saul does drip with honor irony, one of the key ingredients in tragedy. And only the most callous would feel no pity whatsoever in reading this account of his sad death. And yet, none of this is unforeseen. None of it is catching us by surprise. If we've been reading through 1 Samuel and studying it together, then the writing has been on the wall and writ in large letters, increasingly so with every chapter. We, we were told decades before in the life of Saul that God would judge him and there would be an inevitable demise. And ever since then, we've only wondered when and how this sad life would come to its end. Well, 1 Samuel 31 tells us how it ends. Thus Saul died. He died in this way, or therefore Saul died. It's the end of the story of Saul, anyway. 
Let's begin, though, with this very first word in 1 Samuel 31. What's the first word? Now. Now the Philistines were fighting. Sometimes we read now at the beginning of a sentence in a story of the Bible, and it's, well, it's really just um, artistic. It's somewhat filler. It's sort of like saying, so I went to the grocery store yesterday. The so there isn't necessary, per se, and the Bible sometimes uses now in our English Bibles like that, but not here. Here it means something more like meanwhile, and that's important. Really, this is an introductory point for us to consider before we get too deep into the text. Meanwhile, the contrast continues. What contrast? Well, we've been seeing in recent weeks of our study of 1 Samuel that especially toward the end, there's this heightened contrast between King Saul and the king-to-be, David. And so the narrative has bounced back and forth starting in chapter 27 with David, and then a story of Saul, and then David, and then Saul, then David, back and forth. And that's meant to communicate the comparison of these two, the contrast of these two. It's telling us to note the similarities and differences, or the differences on the specific themes. It's showing us that in vivid ways. And the author has gone back and forth from Saul to David, and Saul to David, with this word, now. Go back to chapter 28, verse 3. What do we read there? Again, not a throwaway word. Now Samuel had died. And notice these just keep getting stacked. Chapter 29, verse 1. Now the Philistines had gathered all their forces. And then chapter 30, verse 1. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag, and then culminating in chapter 31, now the Philistines fought against Israel. Not throwaway words, but I think referring somewhat to to chronology. These stories are overlapping stories. Some stories are overlaid with other stories here at the end. You know that the show 24 is back on. Thanks be to God. (laughs) That's a good thing for many reasons, one of which is sermon illustrations. 24 is a great sermon illustration source. And 24 gives us a perfect illustration of this meanwhile storytelling, right? Not by using the word meanwhile by a narrative, a narrator, but by doing what? They split the screens, don't they? This thing's happening while this thing's happening. It happens throughout the, the, the show. And then any given episode usually ends with maybe four tiles of what's happening. And maybe some of them are even rotating. They're showing six different scenes. Each one has its own drama, has its own suspense going on. And so stacking them like this just increases the drama and suspense of what's going on. Well, how do you do something like that with words and not with a split screen? Well, you use words like now or meanwhile. Now, to get more precise, 1 Samuel tells us which scenes here at the end should be stacked on top of another by using geography. I won't go into specifics, but there are geographical hints about where people are and where they go to next that tell us whether it's a a day we're dealing with here or it's the next day, a chapter later, or something like that. Again, I won't go into the specifics of that, and show you the the homework. But along with locations and the movement of people, we have those time markers phrases like now and meanwhile, but also the next day or twilight. And when you piece it all together after some careful study, here's what it looks like. Let's call this day one, what we're going to look at. Day one. The Bible doesn't call it day one, but for our purposes, we'll call it day one. There are three things that happen in in sort of parallel. Saul hears of Philistines assembling back in chapter 28, assembling against Israel in, in war, and he's afraid. At the same time, David is discovering the terror of Ziklag, his homeland, temporarily so anyway. And there, it's been burned to the ground, everything's been taken, including the families. Both kings, you could say, are facing this severe trial. Saul facing the Philistines, David discovering the terror of Ziklag. Then Saul inquires of the Lord in vain in chapter 28. 
Along the same time, David inquires of the Lord and hears. Saul wants a word from the Lord about what to do with the Philistines, and there is nothing but silence. But David inquires of the Lord regarding the Amalekites and hears and is directed and sent out. Saul sets out for Endor to meet with a medium or a witch he's so desperate to hear from God. It's at this point that he hears from the dead prophet Samuel, tomorrow you shall die. We'll see that in just a minute, but know that the tomorrow he's talking about is what we just read, chapter 31, even though they're separated by, by chapter space. At the same time that Saul is setting out to Endor for a medium, David is setting out not unsure, but sure and ready to pursue the Amalekites in chapter 30. These things are happening on the same day. So do a split screen in your mind as you read these and think about these. Hear the boop, 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 boop in, your, in the background here as we're going through these things. The, the, the drama is thick. And then the next day, what we could call day two. On that day, Saul faces Philistines and is slain, which we just read, chapter 31. The same time, David is finding the Amalekites and decimating them. We saw that last week in chapter 30. Both kings facing the enemy, both in battle, and yet with very different outcomes. David, of course, victorious and leading his people into blessing, foreshadowing the inauguration of his kingdom to come. Saul is, of course, as we just read, tragically defeated and dead on the battlefield, bringing his reign to an end and bringing God's promised judgment upon Saul to its completion. Split screen. Okay, with that in mind, I actually want to pull you from the present tense of 1 Samuel 31 for just a bit. I want you to notice in verse 6 how this battle is summarized. The results of this battle are summarized in verse 6 in such a way that they're also a reminder, a reminder of God's judgment. Verse 6 says, Thus Saul died and his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men on the same day together. So here's our first point, first point proper. Saul's judgment, God's word is sure. Verse 6 tells us of Saul's death in such a way that it reminds us of God's judgment and reminds us that God's word is sure. You see, three sons, all his men, on the same day. Well, back three chapters ago, which was the night before, Saul was seeking a witch who was leading in a seance to conjure up the dead prophet Samuel. And and that prophet spoke this truth even from the grave. Verse 18, Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. That's what chapter 31, verse 6 is pointing us back to, reminding us that God has foretold of this judgment to come. He only recently got very specific about it, but he's said it many times before. He, he said through the prophet Samuel in chapter 15 that Saul's reign would come to an end. He, he said in chapter 13 that the offspring of Saul would no longer reign on the throne of Israel to come which means that Saul's death here is no mere tragedy. It's not the accidental death of a big guy who meant well but just kept blundering and blundering and blundering. It is God's just and righteous judgment on a man who was persistent in his rebellion and unbelief and self-consumption. Of course, 1 Samuel 31 never said that God was judging Saul this way, that God was bringing about his death. But, but this happens all over Samuel, right? It's dripping with providence without even speaking it. God's sovereign orchestration is so obvious that it doesn't need to be said. And nevertheless, 1 Chronicles 10, a parallel passage, tells us that God was the chief operator in Saul's death. 
There it says, Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the commandment of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David. However dark 1 Samuel 31 is, it won't do to say God was not there. He was there in judgment. Saul's judgment was foretold, but it was also foreshadowed in various ways. Even before you get to Saul as a person. You remember Hannah's song? Remember that all roads lead back to Hannah in the book of 1 Samuel? Well, we, we read in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 3 of Hannah's song where she said, To the ungodly, to the wicked, talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The whole book of 1 Samuel is one of God thundering against his enemies. His word is sure. Hannah's prophetic prayer began to be fulfilled when God thundered against those wicked priests, Hophni and Phinehas, back in chapter 4 of this book. Meaning that God's enemies are not just those of the outside, you could say. The wicked are not just them. But here in the Old Covenant, they were also within. And judgment must begin with the household of God. Nevertheless, there are outside enemies, and that's part of God's plan and part of Hannah's song. And so in chapter 5, the Ark of the Covenant marches itself, as it were, through Philistia. And wherever it goes, people get boils and die. Judgment. He's thundering against the Philistines there. It looked like God was perhaps going to use Saul to thunder against the wicked nations around Israel. That was the plan, right? Judgment was coming, yes. And yet, Saul proved to be not an instrument of God's thunder against wicked nations, but a king like the nations, and hence one of God's very own enemies, we could say. Thought God thundered against Saul. Thus, Saul died. Keep all that in mind as we go through this chapter now in its flow, in its order. Look at 1 Samuel 31 and note this, that every scene we'll look at and what follows in 1 Samuel 31 points us back to something earlier in the life of Saul or the life of Israel. So we'll keep flipping back. We'll keep referring back to this book as we work through this because God has masterfully woven uh, in the, his authorship of scripture and in his providence, he's woven the, the colors and the hues and the contours that have come before into this final scene. So now we come to Saul's battle. Secondly, Saul's battle, the king flees. Verses 1 through 3. In verse 1, it just says, Israel fled before the Philistines. That's an important word, flee or fled. It's all over, 1 Samuel. And ideally, the Philistines would be the ones fleeing before Israel. They did after David defeated their giant Goliath back in chapter 17. The Philistines fled. They did after David and his men went to war with the Philistines in chapter 19. The Philistines fled. That's what the Amalekites did in the last chapter. David and his 400 men chased down 400 Amalekites. They fled from David and his army. But just like happened back in chapter 4, Israel's first war in 1 Samuel, also against the Philistines, here also Israel fled before the Philistines. It's backwards. It was hoped that Saul would be a means of saving God's people from the hand of the Philistines. God himself said this in 1 Samuel 9. He said, may he save my people from the hand of the Philistines. 
here at the end of his life. Instead, he flees. In fact, he hides. Isn't that what's meant in verse 3 when it says the archers found him? Oh, sure, that means their arrows found him. Hence the next phrase, he was badly wounded by the archers. But it also means that Saul had been retreating. Saul was on the run. Saul had to be found. No surprise when we first met this guy, when Israel first met this guy at his kingly inauguration, he was hiding in the luggage. Imagine that, a kingly inauguration. And here's the king to be hiding In the coat closet. No surprise that he's hiding now from the enemy on the battlefield. It's all so passive as it's described here at the beginning of chapter 31. The only active thing that Saul and his men are doing is fleeing. And everything else describes what is done to them. Overtook. Struck down. Pressed hard. Even Saul's dear sons die on the battlefield And apparently Saul could do nothing. Or apparently Saul did nothing. We're not told why. So here's the battle. It's no battle at all. There is no sword swinging. There's no valiant fighting. There's no going down with honor. Which leads then to Saul's sword. Thirdly, we see Saul's sword, a final request. You see verse 4? Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it and died. Saul's sword should have been mentioned in the earlier verses as an instrument of judgment and war against the enemies, the Philistines. But now Saul's sword is introduced, and now we hear of the sword of his armor bearer mentioned only as instruments for suicide. On the one hand, you can't blame Saul, right? These are desperate circumstances that Saul is in. There's no hope for survival when you're riddled with arrows like this and the enemy is pressing in. There's no hope for survival, humanly speaking. Saul wonders what they will do to him if they get a hold of him. On the other hand, that very concern exposes Saul's self-focus, Saul's doubt-filled heart. You see, his concern is not primarily pain and torture that might come from the Philistines if they find him alive. His primary concern is about honor, his honor. I mean, it seems as though there's something of vanity here. Stab me through. I'll fall on my sword so that they don't get a chance to mutilate me. He seems more concerned with appearances than God's honor or what is best to do. He refers to the Philistines as these uncircumcised. That should perhaps remind us of that young but zealous shepherd boy who came to the battle against the Philistines in chapter 17 and heard the giant Goliath mock their God. And David said... Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David was appalled at Goliath's blasphemy. And hence he used that phrase, this this uncircumcised. Saul uses a similar phrase, not because he protests God's name being besmirched and wants to defend it, but again, that he might defend his honor. And so he calls on his armor bearer to finish him off. Of course, the armor bearer refuses, and so Saul does it himself, falling on his own sword and taking his own life. This is not his last act of honor, as one stupid scholar said about it this week. I read 
One guy said, this is Saul's final act of honor. No, no, no. This is all in a trajectory of Saul's life, and it's the culmination of a man who has been filled with self and consumed with self and bent on self-ruin. His self-ruin lifestyle culminates in his self-ruin. This is not a man who's blinded by crippling depression, as are some believers who get so broken in their thinking and in their feeling that they entertain this possibility or even follow through with it. But for Saul, instead, falling on his sword and taking his own life is the culmination of a whole life bent on self-destruction, a whole life folded in on itself and now folded over on itself. It's his final act of rebellion. It's his final act of unbelief. It epitomizes his lack of trust in God and it demonstrates his concern to protect his own fragile honor. It's terribly ironic. Throughout his life, Saul had proved to be a man who trusts in the sword. His military philosophy, not God's, not David's, but Saul's military philosophy might be by might and by height and by sword and by spear that is ever by my side. Remember? He's a man who has lived by the sword and now dies by the sword. The sword is his last trust. It is his final act. Did you notice what's missing in these dying moments? What's missing in Saul's final words? Did you think about what could have been? Repentance, sorrow, contrition, Prayer, confession, humility. He could have prayed like David did once in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet we shouldn't be surprised because we've seen this sort of thing from Saul several times in his life. When he was confronted by the people in chapter 14 for his sin, it says he went away. And when the prophet confronted him in chapter 15, he defended himself and then went home. And when the prophet spoke of the imminent judgment to come in chapter 28, Saul fell to the ground, he ate a meal, and he went out that night. Those passages are remarkable for what they don't say. No repentance, no sorrow for sin, no prayer, no confession. You say, it was a done deal. God had said, judgment is coming, you will die tomorrow. Yeah, but, but God has, in many key cases in the Bible, issued a judgment that is responded to in repentance, and he had relented. And likely, Saul would not have been given the throne then to, to rule forever until he dies. No, but he could have been restored to his Lord. He could have repented, we think, right? And we should. What a reminder this is to not wait, to get right with God, to not put off repentance. Whether you're not a Christian who's never come to see your need for a Savior, you've never repented of your sin, you've never called on him for salvation, or you're a Christian who has, in recent days, hardened your heart against the Lord, become comfortable with sin, and become unfamiliar with repentance. Do not put off repentance do you not know that putting off repentance today may mean you never repent again? Call on him while he may be found. Seek the Lord today. You may not repent tomorrow or on your deathbed. Saul didn't. Fourthly, we see Saul's people. We see Saul's people, and hence a new exile. What does Saul's death mean for his people, the people he was to shepherd and protect? Well, we've already seen what it meant for those who were closest to him. Verse 6, the armor bearer, his sons, and all Saul's men dead together. The closer you get to Saul, the more dangerous it is. 
Remember David, by the way, who once said, hey, stay with me, because the guy who wants to take my life wants to also take your life. Stay with me and you will be in safe keeping, proximity and safety. Here with Saul, proximity and death. And as for the broader effects of this defeat on the battlefield, well, verse 7, when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley, we don't know how far that is, we don't know how extensive this was, but that's not right close, is it? And those beyond the Jordan, when they saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. Here are Saul's people, at least for the moment. And here they are fleeing before Philistines. Here they are giving up their, their homes for Philistines. This is a, a new exile. It's a proto-exile, an early version of what God will do later on, many hundreds of years later, where he exiles his people from the land in judgment and puts them in Babylon for a time. Here, God's people have been exiled from their homes in the land. It's a reverse conquest. What was gained in Joshua in coming into the land and defeating the Canaanites and getting their land and their homes now has been done to them, and they're cast out. And what's worse is that this meant that the Philistines now occupied land across the middle of Israel's land, dividing north and south, dividing and conquering. Again, remember, Saul was to save God's people from the Philistines and to lead the people in those promises of old, like that given to Abraham that they'd be in the land, they'd be in the land and have blessing. Like that which was given to, to Joshua, that you'd have rest on all sides. That which is given to Moses, that you'd, you'd get in, there'd be victory, and it'd be a land flowing with milk and honey. Saul was to be God's instrument for a time to bring about God's promises in that land and among those people. And instead, now the people are sheep without a shepherd. Oh, I know, one's coming. That's next week as we turn the page to 2 Samuel 1. A shepherd is coming who will shepherd God's people in God's strength. But for now, 1 Samuel 31 ends with the sheep without a shepherd. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, Jesus said. It's a principle that was true in his time and here in 1 Samuel 31. And that's what the people do, they scatter. Now as we're getting closer to the end of this chapter, we can see the contrast between David and Saul even clearer. And remember, that's what the author wants us to do. He wants us to contrast these two kings to show us what it's like to be under this one or that one. Which one is God's one and which one is yours. So let's just gather up some of the, some of the things we're seeing and have seen even already today and add to it and put them in some nice, neat piles of contrast between David and Saul. For instance, what we've already said, David inquired of the Lord and was led by the Lord when Saul inquired of the Lord, though, he got only silence and then judgment. With no strength, that's what it said in chapter 30, after they wept so long they had no strength, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. When Saul had no strength, in chapter 28, he was strengthened by a witch and her food. Same word word used here. He was strengthened by the witch. David was divinely rescued via Philistines when the Philistines were about to go to war with Israel and some of the commanders said, David is not going with us. It got David out of that pickle of having to fight against his own people or be in the midst of the Philistines and decide to fight against them. He was divinely rescued via Philistines, but Saul was divinely judged via Philistines proving that God can use Philistines like, it, like duct tape and like screwdrivers. They're good for anything almost. <laughs> David faced God's enemies with confidence in chapter 30 as he fought the Amalekites. Saul faced God's enemies with frozen fear. Verse 
when facing death, David sought the Lord for strength. But when facing death, Saul asked his servant to expedite it. David pursued and struck down the Amalekites in chapter 30. But Saul fled and hid and was struck down by the enemy in chapter 31. With David, none of his 400 men died in chapter 30. But with Saul, everyone around him died. Israel's enemies fled before David and company in chapter 30. They fled. And Israelites here in chapter 31 fled at, at their enemies and because of Saul's death. David plundered the enemies in chapter 30. But here, the Philistines plundered Saul and the Israelites around the battle. We'll see this one in just a minute. David sent out good news of victory to his people at the end of chapter 30. He gave gifts to the elders of Israel and said, tell them, tell them the enemies of the Lord are defeated. Here we'll see in just a minute, the Philistines sent out good news of Saul's death in chapter 31. And here's the summary of it. At the end of chapter 30, David has led Israel in peace and care and blessing, at least a portion of Israel, but it's emblematic of the whole and the reign to come. And emblematic of the whole is this little corner of Israel here around the battle against the Philistines where now Saul has led Israel into utter chaos and shame and exile. What a difference. But let's move on in the story. The fifth thing to note is Saul's body. It's an idolatrous gospel. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 8, the next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent messengers or preachers throughout the land of the Philistines, to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. Good news. In the New Testament, the word gospel is used. It means good news, a message of good news, something that has happened and news about it. It's spoken, it's told, it's communicated. Well, the gospel of the New Testament is glorious. There's a gospel of the Philistines here that's hideous, idolatrous. It's a, an idol's gospel. It's good news to the Philistines. You see, the antichrist of the Old Testament, Saul, has now become an anti-gospel in his slain body. There's a message, and here's the proof. The body is marched through the land of the Philistines with messengers accompanying it, saying, he's dead. We won. Good news. Victory is ours. They strip him of his armor first. They cut off his head and then they march that slain, naked, headless body around their land until they finally bring it to a temple of Ashtaroth, the female goddess counterpart to Dagon. You might remember him from chapter 5, that idol Dagon. And there in the temple of Ashtaroth, they hang Saul's body, a symbol of victory like a a hunter hangs a, a head of a deer in his living room. But it wasn't just a victory march. It wasn't just a victory, victory memorial when they hung Saul in their temple. It was a theological statement. They weren't just saying that Israel had been defeated, but the God of Israel had been defeated. And their gods were stronger and better. The representative of the God of Israel had been slain and his head cut off and he is now hung like a trophy in the temple of Ashtaroth like it's, like, like it's hers, like it's her dear head. They think it proves that God cannot protect his anointed. 
So either he's fake or dead or weak, but whatever, he's no bother to us anymore. Do you get the sadness of this scene then? You see how multi-layered it is? It's not just the end of one guy, the end of one family. It's not, not just a bad battle. It's not just shame for Israel. It is that, but it is the shame of God. It, it is God's disgrace that is being pronounced in that idolatrous gospel. This gospel continues to be spoken and preached. This idolatrous gospel it happens anytime someone says, God is dead. Jesus is a joke. Anytime someone takes an atheistic pledge and to, to prove that God is not there, the gospel of Ashtaroth has been preached again. Back in chapter 5, the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and they put it in their temple of their god Dagon. And remember, every night Dagon was flipped over and bowing before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, once even having his head knocked off. They had to put their idol back. And eventually they sent the Ark of the Covenant away, essentially admitting that they had lost. Oh, what sweet revenge this is now, right? To have the Lord's anointed, headless, in your temple as a sign that Yahweh is dead. But, this is important. Don't forget that Saul was not only judged by God, but Saul himself was judgment upon the people. He was God's judgment upon a people who said, give us a king like the nations have, and thereby rejected God as their king. They wanted a king who they could see, a king who was tall, a king you could trust in, a king who would go out in front of you and fight your battles for you. God interpreted all that for the prophet Samuel when he said in chapter 8, he said, they've rejected me from being king over them. To all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they're doing to you, to me, right now. You see, the request for a king besides God was idolatrous. It was looking for another god. They're looking for a God replacement. And so how fittingly, Saul, their idol, is hung up where he belongs among the idols of the world. He goes and joins the pantheon of idols in the temple of Ashtaroth. Dare we say, poetic divine justice you see, God in this way is showing that he will not be mocked. Saul's death is judgment upon Saul for his wicked and persistent rebellion, and it's judgment upon a people who said, give us another king. We want a king who isn't like a viceroy under you, the real king, but we want a king like the nations, and we want to trust in him. God said, you got it. You got it. It's going to be a long 30 years or so. And yet, here's how it ends. The Philistines think they have shamed Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. And by putting the idol of Saul in their pantheon of idols, they have proven God's justice and righteousness. Well, now lastly... At the end, there is some glimmer in the dark cloud of chapter 31. Sixth, Saul's burial. It's an ironic end. Saul's burial is an ironic end. Who went and got him? The people of Jabesh Gilead, it says. They go on a mission to get the body of Saul back from the Philistines. It would have been a difficult, risky, long and hard mission it's their valiant men, it says, who, who go. It must be like their SEAL Team 6. 
This would have been going 20 miles in the dark to try to get the prize trophy of the Philistines, sneak it out, and bring it all the way back to your land, another 20 miles or so. Now, why do they embark on this risky mission? Well, you have to know that they have deep gratitude for King Saul. They have history together. Saul's first act as king in chapter 11 of this book was to rescue the people of Jabesh Gilead. He rescued them valiantly from their enemies. No doubt gratitude is part of their motivation for going and getting the body of their king. Because of that first act as king, because of that one great shining moment. Well, it wasn't just one. There were many, actually, in Saul's life. A handful, we should say. In chapter 14, you get some of Saul's best and shining moments put together succinctly. It's almost like an obituary. What goes into an obituary? The good stuff. No one puts in an obituary. Uh, Dad had a real bad temper, and for two years, he was out of work and drank way too much. No one puts that in the obituary, right? It's good stuff that goes in there. And, and, and that's what you see in 1 Samuel 14 regarding Saul. It says, he took out those people, he fought this battle, he conquered them, he had this kid, this kid, this kid, this kid, this wife, and this armor bearer. It's just what would go into an obituary. What's remarkable about it, though, is that it's written so early. 1 Samuel 14 is 30 years before Saul's death. He's been written out of history, you could say. The end is as good as done. Write the obituary now. He's not going to do anything good anymore. And he doesn't. The, the rest of the story is Saul growing in his jealousy and consumed with David's destruction. And so he doesn't rule righteously and he doesn't lead into battle. There's nothing good to report after chapter 14. All the good of his life had already been done. And now it's as if he's as good as dead. There has to be some application in that for some of us here. Maybe for all of us here as we get later in life. God calls us to finish well. He tells us to run the race, striving for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He calls us to finish well. Maybe you're like Saul. All your good stuff happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30. Oh, I know people retire. I know seasons change. Kids grow up and move out of the house but there has to be some sort of you version of Saul and his obituary, we could say, being written way back in chapter 14. Oh, keep on, brothers and sisters. Finish well. But back to the end here. It's an ironic end. Because Saul saved Jabesh Gilead valiantly, but now in the end here has to be saved by them. His body does anyway. Now, it's kind of sweet of them, but it's oh so sad. And surely an unintended irony is that they bury him under a tamarisk tree. It was chapter 22 that we lost, last saw Saul under a tamarisk tree. His men about him, his armor laden over his body, and his spear at his sword... And now here at the end of his life, back under a tamarisk tree, naked, headless, dead, and alone. That's the end of the story. That's the end of Saul's story. Isn't it interesting that it ends with a burial? The end of the story is a burial. At first it looked hopeful or encouraging or sweet, like... At least some people like Saul. At least some were thankful. But it has this bitter ring to it, doesn't it? It's all irony. It's all irony. And it's just burial. And really, that's true of all of us, isn't it? It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Saul's story is unique. And yet it's not. It's universal. Saul is 
typical of all of us. We, we may not die in the battlefield. We may not die as king. We may not die in specific judgment from the Lord. But we all die. And we all die because of sin. The wages of sin is death. The day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die, God said to Adam and Eve. And as you turn the page in Genesis from, from their sin in Genesis 3... You see Genesis 5, this list of generations there. So-and-so lived so many years, and he died. Death becomes this chorus, this mantra. So-and-so lived so many years, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. And so the mantra continues. The chorus still rings loud and clear. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Thus, Ryan died, will one day be said. Thus, Steve died. Thus, Jennifer died. Fill in your name. Saul died. It should remind us that all die. Woody Allen said, I don't mind death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. None of us do. It is ugly. It is inevitable. It is decisive. And it is final. And Saul's death reminds us of all those things. It is bloody. It is dead. It is hopeless if it just ends like this. So what hope is there? I mean, even David, the king to come, the truly anointed one of 1 and 2 Samuel, he dies also. Sorry to give it away. David dies later in the story. David comes and he can solve some problems that Saul can't, but he can't fix the oldest problem in the book. He died. He died. We die. We keep dying. And what of Hannah's song, which got our hopes up, when she sang that the Lord kills and he brings to life? Who? When? How? Well, you know. You can anticipate it if you're a Christian, you know your Bible a bit. You know that a thousand years later, there was another king who was buried. He was hung by the rulers of his day. He was hung as a spectacle for others to see. They, they thought the gospel had been preached. He, it's done. He's no more. He's no more trouble to us. And his disciples came and they they were thankful for him, so they got him down, and they cared for his body, and they buried him. And they thought it was the last chapter. They thought it was just like Saul's death. That's it. That's the end of the story. Oh, but it wasn't. Jesus was raised on the third day, bringing in a whole new creation, entering, leading us in, in eternal life life to come so it says in Acts chapter 2 Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God that Jesus you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men Peter preached God raised him up though loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it and then he quotes David in one of the Psalms where David says, you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Indeed, David did protect, God did protect David's life. David was protected from death for much of his life, all until the very end. Imagine that. But Jesus was protected through death and hence he has disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. He's defeated death. So Hebrews 12, 2 says he came that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. How ironic that a bloody, death-filled chapter like 1 Samuel 31 can lead us down a path where we get to conclude, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And Christ has defeated death. He's defeated the one who had the power over death, and he leads us into fearlessness. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear anything. 
Who can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. So we can trust him. Let's pray. Oh God, we ask for your help to trust you. We want confidence in you, belief in you, worship of you, salvation in you, Lord Jesus, to spread here. For some, that means believing it for the first time, and for others of us here, it means believing it afresh. We pray, Lord, you would help our unbelief. We pray, Lord, you'd keep us from trusting in chariots, and chariots of bank accounts and economies and rulers of this age or parents even. Keep us from trusting in the, the chariots and the swords of resumes or skills or physical ability or intellect. Lord, keep us from trusting in idols and cause us to trust in you. We can trust in you because you've shown yourself faithful in history, especially with Jesus on the cross, dying in our place and being raised in the third day. We believe, Lord Jesus, you've defeated the devil and defeated death and we have nothing to fear and we can trust you. Help us now to sing of that truth and reality and to feel it in our bones, to sing it loudly and worshipfully for your namesake and glory, we pray. Amen.